welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation featuring Sir Ian McKellen. Though he needs little introduction, Sir Ian's work has garnered dozens of accolades, among them a Tony Award for his role as Salieri in the Broadway presentation of Amadeus, four Olivier Awards for his many performances in London's West End, among them starring roles in Bend and Wild Honey, a Screen Actors Guild Award for his portrayal of Gandalf the Grey in The Fellowship of the Rings, and a Golden Globe Award for his depiction of Nicholas II in Rasputin. Speaking with Sir Ian will be John Andrews, a longtime NEC member and founder of the Shakespeare Guild. Following the conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom or the chat function in YouTube for any questions you might have. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Sir Ian McKellen and John Andrews. Please enjoy the program. Ian, uh, have you been to the National Arts Club? I know you spent a lot of time in New York. And it's no, on, I, I, oh, I don't think I have, no. It's but right I, next to the players. Oh, yeah. Ground. And I'm sure you've been to the players many times. I, I have been to the players and, and, and Edwin Booth's uh, bedroom. Am, am I right? Did, didn't That's he, right. That's didn't right. He, he died there, didn't he? He did. Yeah. Yes. He, uh, I think it was 1893. He had lived there for about, I think, five years. Wow. And had established it both as his home and as a club yes. for his fellow actors. Yes, yes. Nice. And uh, it's a wonderful historic setting. Hmm. And speaking of historic uh, things, I, I, I must say I really admire that tartan you're wearing. Could you tell us about that? Uh, yes, uh, I've just popped it on. Uh, I, I'm in London at the moment where it's a rather dull day. And I, I live by the river and it's, it's, it's damp and, 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 and uh, the fog is descending in a rather Dickensian way, but uh, this is, has a Shakespearean uh, connection. It, it's uh, the tartan uh, for Macbeth. Uh, some people might think it, it being an unlucky play, it was unlucky, it, very unlucky to wear, but uh, Macbeth was rather a lucky play for me. I was in a wonderful pro production of it with, with Judy Dent, directed by Trevor Nunn, and uh, ever since I, I, I wear the tartan on um, on special occasions. It seemed appropriate. I love that. Well, <laughs> that that production was one of the most uh, amazing things I have ever seen in the theater. Yeah. It was in 1976. You were also playing Leontes yes. and Romeo that season, if I recall. I was, yes. And uh, and and uh, and you and Judy at the, at the other place. Uh, if I recall, could you describe the set? I, I, it was a, a circular um, set with the actors sitting around the yes. playing area when they were not uh, performing. Am I right about that? The original other place in Stratford w was a tin hut. Yes. Where, where they kept uh, old costumes. Ah. And and some uh, young young uh, young directors suggested it might make a theatre, and uh, so everything was cleared out, and uh, there was room for about a hundred people to 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 sit uh, round a thrust stage, and there was a little balcony uh, for for others uh, to be seated. It was the model for what later became the Donmar uh, Theatre uh, in London, and. Uh, uh, very much a studio place, and we right. we did, uh, 
it, it, was, it, it wasn't a very congenial building. Uh, it wasn't heated and it wasn't cooled in the summer. And we were playing in the hottest summer that, that England had ever had. Uh, and uh, it, the sunlight beats onto the, the, the tin roof. When it rained, of course, you heard the rain, uh, or, or rather suitable for Macbeth, which uh, a lot Special of effects. Yes, takes place out of doors. But it was a um, um, very simple idea. John Napier, the designer, drew a magic circle on, on the wooden floor in white, and we sat around it, uh, and beyond us, the audience, we, 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 the actors were encouraged to watch scenes that they weren't in. Everything was on display. When I came in with my hand, blooded hands, having killed a Duncan, uh, the audience could see me dipping them into a bowl of uh, pretend blood. Uh, and uh, the most startling light, lighting effect was, uh, I think, a 40-watt light bulb that was just swinging on a, on a yes. wire. If you remember that I swung it round and round at one point. Uh, every, everything was very, very simple. The costumes were all from second-hand shops. Uh, and uh, very the, the whole production, the, the costumes, the set, cost 250 pounds. It's a, then about $300. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but the, the effect of the play in that confined space, uh, no interval, played in two hours. It's quite a short play which may, may be why it's the most popular one with, with audiences. Um, but the, the, th the thriller aspect of what's going to happen next was, was possible as we, we, we raced through it. And it was also possible, this was the big thing for me, having played in very large theatres up to that point, uh, was that one didn't have to project, one didn't have to select what, which bit of the character one wanted to impress the audience with. You just basically said the lines and let the play work its magic. Well, that was a wonderful preparation for subsequent Shakespeare that I've done, and also for uh, subsequent work I did in the in the cinema, because the camera, of course, is the closest audience of all. Right. Uh, and this uh, that other play's production of Macbeth was the beginning of uh, of my wanting to. Uh, not overplay as much as I had been doing uh, in the past. And I think without it, I, I would never have um, had any success in front of the camera. I think uh, everyone was dressed in black, if I recall, all of the actors. Yes. And it was a very claustrophobic uh, yes. atmosphere, which was perfect for the play. And I yeah, I was going to ask, um, I think, uh, I don't re recall that I've ever seen you do Shakespeare in what would be called period uh, costume. Ah. A am I right about that? I think you probably are, yes. Yes. Well, it, it first hit me uh, the idea that it was, it was unhelpful to <clears throat> dress a modern production of Shakespeare in uh, dress contemporary with either the play uh, or, or when it was written. Uh, and when, when I did a production of Coriolanus, directed by the great uh, Shakespeare director of my youth, uh, Tyrone Guthrie, mm. uh, after whom the Guthrie Theatre in Minneapolis is named. Guthrie was the man who inspired and built Stratford Theatre in, in Ontario. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and latterly, the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield in, in, in the United mm -hmm. Kingdom. And I remember him saying, uh, you, you, you can't do Coriolanus in togas. If we're all in togas, nobody knows who anybody is because everybody looks the same. Uh, and so he set it in the oh, late 18th century where soldiers could wear uniforms. You know, there was no such thing as a uniform in, uh, for soldiers in Shakespeare's mm -hmm. time. So how do you know who, who's the captain and who's the general? On uh, right. so Once you put people in clothes as opposed to costumes, then you begin to, you know, there are pockets for hands to go into and, and pockets to hold things. And uh, 
if you're doing, let's say, Richard III, a production that Richard Eyre directed when eventually I turned into a movie, uh, that was set in the 1930s, uh, partly because if you do that, you know who everybody is. You know who's royal, right. uh, who's, a, who's a politician, who, who works in the church, who's a civil servant, uh, what rank of soldier they might be. All this is immediately obvious because of the clothes they're wearing. And very helpful if you're trying to work out who all those lords are in, in, in Richard III, a very political play, uh, examining the political structure of a country. Uh, so it's a simple matter of, of, of helping the story uh, along. It, it isn't to say necessarily that these characters belong out of their own period. They don't. You have to think you have, as an actor to, to think as the characters would have thought. Uh, but um, costume, I prefer clothes. Hmm. Well, it was brilliant in, in the the stage production as well as in the film. I saw the stage production at the Kennedy Center. I think you had already- uh, Richard III. In Washington. I was at the time at, at the Folger Shakespeare Library. And yeah. I remember uh, a particular bit of stage business involving uh, the donning of your glove. That <laughs> was uh, just wonderful. That happened just by chance. It was after the scene with Lady Anne in which he seduced the wife of, of the man he has killed. Uh, uh, and, and in the process of doing that, he, he suggests that she might want to kill him and he offers her his uh, weapon and bears his... Excuse, excuse me. We'll, we'll have to not... Thank you, that was a friend. Uh, uh, and and he, he bears his chest, uh, uh, that's in the text. Now, right. in, in our version, I, I could only use one hand. This hand was useless, and that side of my body, half made up is the phrase that he oh, uses himself. Right. So uh, I was left with the what to do uh, during the soliloquy that happens, speaking to the audience after Lady Anne has left, because I had a shirt to do up and a jacket to put back on, all with one hand, uh, and a hat to put on, and buttons, and I don't know what. Uh, and then one day, uh, um, I, I dared to put on the glove, and I managed to get my hand inside it, and discovered that just by doing that, the leather glove fell into place. Nothing to do with it. It was just chance. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> the audience used to uh, like that uh, enormously. Uh, it's it's a problem playing Richard. He he's clearly disabled in many uh, physically, and you wonder how could this man ever have been a soldier, uh, a man of action, wield a sword? And I thought, well, I'm not going to make him all uh, bent double. I'm going to be as erect as possible, as if he's conquered his uh, deformity. Uh, and then, of course, when we discovered not not long ago the actual remains of the real Richard the Third. Who was a person? Oh, were you there for that? Nothing like Shakespeare's, uh, but but they discovered. Yes, he did. He had a, yes. a, a curved spine, uh, and yet um, was clearly a, a, a man of action. So, if the real man managed to do it, of course, the actor has to do it as well. Yeah. Well, I remember you you talked with uh, Richard Eyre in an interview that I saw a few weeks ago on YouTube, and um, and and mentioned that you had, uh, among other things, done a tour in Japan. And that while you were there, you went to see a kabuki performance. Ah. Yes, and worked I, a bit of kabuki business into the- uh, uh, No, it wasn't kabuki. Uh, yes, it was kabuki, yes. Uh, well, at the end of this um, soliloquy I was mentioning with the glove, uh, I think I saluted the audience. And as I saluted the audience, they. They, they burst into applause uh, uh, and off I went. Uh, but in Tokyo, uh, at the, the Shakespeare Globe, a theater which only has only produces Shakespeare from mm. all over the world. How wonderful to live in Tokyo and, and have all Yes, these. I've seen that theater, yes. Yes. Well, uh, I, I reached the end of uh, 
the speech and saluted as normal and, 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 and left the stage in absolute silence. And in fact, the audience didn't indicate that they were there or uh, let, let alone um, that they were enjoying what they saw. And I thought, well, this is just the Japanese way until I went to a matinee of um, Kabuki, which is an all day event, it seems. Uh, you take the family and you take your lunch with you, your, your sandwiches and something to drink, and you make a great deal of noise. And when your favorite actor comes onto the stage, you, you bellow your welcome. And when he leaves the stage, ditter. Uh, but I noticed that when these, these, these great shaggy uh, characters in the play, particularly the men, left the stage, after their final word of their speech, they would do uh, a big inhale of breath through the nose. <laughs> and that seemed to be a cue for the audience to shout out, God bless you, may you live for may your house live forever, or the Japanese equivalent. So having, <laughs> having seen that in the afternoon, when I came to the end of my dressing up speech with the glove and I <laughs> saluted, I risked going, <laughs> and was rewarded with a huge round of applause. So I kept that in, but, but only when we were in Japan. I loved it, yes. <laughs> well, now, it was your idea then to turn it into a film, am I correct? Uh, yeah. And Richard was, he, he, had a, he had a day job at the National Theater, as he I recall. He, he, he encouraged me to write a screenplay, which I did, and send it to him. He said, oh, well, this, is, this isn't what I thought you meant, which is a tele, as it were, televised version of the show with the cameras firmly in the audience. You've written a, a screenplay for a movie. He said, I can't direct a movie. I'm, I'm running the National Theatre. So I was then on my own. And it took two years, and I've, I've never done it before or since, producing. I, I went around to all the Hollywood studios and, and, and made my pitch People used to like the pitch, but uh, didn't want to help me make the movie. But eventually, uh, producers were found and the wonderful director, Richard Longcrane. And, uh, well, you know, we gathered together a, a, a pretty good cast. Maggie Smith, yes. Annette Benning, Robert Downey Jr., um, uh, Jim Broadbent, uh, and, and many stalwart uh, British uh, actors. Uh, and uh, I remember the fir first day of being on location uh, uh, when Richard was getting ready for battle and we, we had a great big uh, old steam train that was in a museum up there. It had belonged to Hitler. It was Hitler's Wonderful. train. And that seemed rather appropriate as we were doing a 1930s version of, with rather Nazi-like uniforms. Right. Uh, and there were, there were 50, um, horses and their guardians and some Alsatian dogs and uh, <laughs> scores of extras. And I just saw this scene. I was so excited and think, well, my goodness, they wouldn't be here if I hadn't decided I wanted to try and film Bruce and Third. And I got a glimpse of what it must be like to be a producer. Uh, up to then, I thought producers had a rather boring life. You know, they're just trying to collect money and, and paying people uh, too little for their services. But no, I, I, can, see, I can see the thrill of it. And you produced a, a wonderful uh, ah. screenplay production uh, of you. production. Yes. And I remember uh, at one point in this, you talk about uh, uh, how you were thinking about who you might cast while you were playing in Los Angeles and several members of uh, actors that you had worked with before, among them Meryl Streep yeah. uh, stopped by. And I think you had done this, uh, this wonderful scene in Plenty with her yeah. in the foreign office. Yes, yes. yes. And, uh, and I recall that you, you, uh, you were silently auditioning them. And, uh, and do you recall what it was you asked her? No. Do you uh, know? And, there, there's a note in your in your uh, in your uh, screenplay here, in which you say that you uh, you told her that you were going to cast uh, uh, Elizabeth as um, an American 
uh, heiress. Uh, and, so I, I, and I asked her if she could do an American accent, did I? Yes. And and I guess she didn't she didn't pass the audition. Am I right about that? <laughs> <laughs> when we were doing that film of plenty from David Hare's play, um, directed by Fred Skepsy, we just we, we had a couple of scenes together, I think, and got on so well. Uh, I, I said when I left the production, the film, uh, could we perhaps consider working together on stage? Oh, yes, 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 she said. But she said, at the moment, she said, I'm getting quite a few film offers and I, I feel I should do them because it's all going to dry up any day now. And then, of course, I'll be back in the theatre and, and it'll be lovely to work. Well, I'm still waiting, of course, because that, <laughs> that film career uh, continues gloriously, thank goodness. Uh, but I am robbed. I've been robbed of that uh, pleasure. Well, that, that was such an amazing, amazing film. And uh, I, I, I just can't imagine it ever been as effectively as, as you did it. Oh, well, you are kind. I mean, it, 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 I can take some credit in that the original stage production was devised, the, the look of it and the tone of it, the mood were, were, was fixed by Richard uh, uh, and uh, Bob Crowley, the designer, Mm -hmm. and, and me, and we met her over months in Richard's office when he had time uh, and decided that um, uh, the best way to do it was to set it uh, not too, in, in the not too distant past because the events of the real Richard III would be about as distant from the audience who first saw the play as the audience who saw our stage production were from the events of the 1930s when I was alive. Uh, right. And when it looked possible that uh, England might conceivably uh, uh, have a dictator, maybe a royal one, uh, in keeping with uh, what was happening in, in uh, many countries, Italy, Germany and Spain, uh, during that time when um, tyrants were uh, ruling. Uh, so th that that all happened b b because of the three of us and, and I was just able to take advantage of it further with the film. Well, if I recall correctly, it was shortly after that film was released that, uh, that we established the, uh, the Gielgud Award uh, for Excellence in the Dramatic Arts. Yes. And, uh, and you kindly uh, came to the Folger for uh, a ceremony in which you became the first recipient of that award. Was I the first? Oh, you I were say. indeed. Were indeed. I say well. Uh, can you can you remember? Did we after? Was it on that occasion that we all went off to the White House? Or is it, was it another occasion? You went to the White House. I think you had a, was it a brother-in-law or a cousin uh, who was a member of the staff of the Clinton administration? Oh, no, no, I didn't. Oh, yes, there, there was a reception. There, there was a reception at the White House in 1982. And that was when uh, you were playing uh, Shakespeare, Ian McKellen's acting Shakespeare. Well, well remember. Uh, there was a special uh, production of it. Uh, it was, uh, it was um, to, to mark the 50th anniversary of the Folger. That's right. Ronald right. Reagan was in, in the White House then. Now, let, yes. let, let me tell you that that's a very good introduction and, and fancy you remembering better than I do. Well, uh, we, we all, we all part, after I'd done a part of my show in, in the Folger, uh, we all then went to the White House for a reception with uh, and speech from from the president, who right. was who was recently <clears throat> recovered from from the assassination attempt, you know. Yes, right. Uh, and and when they announced his name and we all stood up, he and and uh, Mrs. Reagan ran into the room. Uh, I think to prove I'm all right. I'm alive. Yeah, I like that. Yes. Uh, and then he gave the most charming uh, speech uh, about Shakespeare. 
about how he had played uh, Kate, I think it was, in The Shrew when he was a boy. Really? Interesting. Uh, and, and then he said, uh, quite movingly at one point, um, he, held, he held up, uh, not this, but, but the works of Shakespeare. And right. he, said, he said, I often think if we could only understand and respond to every word in this book, uh, what a better place the world would be. Well, yes. he said this to a lot of Shakespeare enthusiasts who took it to heart right. and, and loved mm -hmm. it. Not that long after, I was back at home watching on television as Ronald Reagan was in the, the Bible Belt uh, down south in America, uh, raising funds and support, I think, for his own re-election. And in front of a a group, a Christian group, I guess, I saw him pick up another book, this time the Holy Bible, and he said, right. <laughs> if only we could respond to and understand the words in this good book, what a better place the world would be. And I thought, well, uh, that's being a politician, isn't it? Uh, if you've yes. got a good line, use it in any circumstance. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and, and those two books, by the way, you, you remember uh, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote a, uh, a book about America in the 19th century. And he pointed out that wherever you went uh, on the frontier of 19th century America, you could always plan on seeing two books, the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare. Amazing, isn't it? So, yes, the, the affection that Shakespeare has attracted to himself is, is astonishing. I think perhaps it's because so many teachers at schools and, and colleges are devoted to Shakespeare and have seen him in the theater that they pass on their own uh, enthusiasms. But, and I'm sure in the 19th century, rather than going to see a production of Shakespeare, what might happen is that the family would sit around the table while the patriarch uh, read it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but um, yes, I suppose those are the first two books that uh, in the Western world would be thought to be the most precious. Now, was that the? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not one who supports reading Shakespeare. I, I think it's very, very difficult. It's much better to hear Shakespeare. Yes, uh, and that's what I spend my life uh, allowing people to do, really. Uh, I, 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 I do discourage people, whatever age they are, if they're seeing their first Shakespeare, yes, you get some hint as to state of affairs at the beginning of the plot, but don't try and read it at home because that, that's a very difficult thing. Leave that to the scholars and to the actors uh, uh, and, and then be what you're meant to be in a theatre, be an audience, audio, listening. Right. Uh, yes, and, and uh, uh, that, that that's the best way. Hmm. You know, I remember seeing, uh, uh, I think it was in 2016 at the Royal Shakespeare Theater, there was a, a gala that had been organized by uh, artistic director Greg Doran. And he brought in various uh, stars, among other things, to uh, show how to do the most famous line in Hamlet. <laughs> and I remember uh, Judy appeared as Hamlet the Dame. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am Hamlet the Dame. It is I, Hamlet the Dame. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you and, and several other actors uh, came up with various ways to, uh, to do the line. Yes. Thinking which word should be accented. And, yes. Uh, yes. 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 Uh, well, it's worth looking up on 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 YouTube, and there is a surprise entrance, which perhaps we shouldn't spoil it, uh, at the end of, of a very celebrated uh, person uh, who is himself a prince. So perhaps we. Uh, yes. 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 Who I've, provides I've, the to, be, to be or not to be or not to be. Uh, when I played it in 1971 or two, I used to, 
I used to try and inflect it to explain what I thought the line actually meant. Uh, not to live or not to live, but to be, to exist, to, to, to flourish, to, to be what one is meant to be, uh, or still alive, uh, but not to be, not able to uh, be fully uh, fulfilled, to be, to, to be or not to be. That, that, that's, those are the words I stressed. I expect to the bewilderment of, of, of the audience. It's a tricky speech. Uh, and uh, when I, I went to see a, a renowned a Don at Cambridge University and asked him what he thought I should do with the speech, and he didn't hesitate. He said, oh, cut it. Don't do it. Don't yes. use it. He said it doesn't belong. It doesn't belong in the play. It was a party piece that he'd written, uh, and, and it was, uh, he, he then found a way of, of pushing it into a play. I don't think that's quite right, but it isn't as in, as important a speech within the play as it has become uh, outside the play. Oddly, uh, yes, and uh, we're. we're I'm in the middle of preparing to, to do Hamlet, and I mean to play Hamlet. Yes. 82-year-old Hamlet. Uh, we'll have to see how that goes. But um, I, we, we, we've placed it uh, in a position in the play where I think it will surprise the audience. And uh, it is the biggest problem of that speech is uh, how do you get the audience to listen to it afresh? Well, I think perhaps we've found a way of doing that. And if you think it's odd that an 82 year old should be playing Hamlet, uh, I agree. But I was rather encouraged the other day to realize that Edwin Booth, man we're talking about at the players, uh, his last performance ever was Hamlet at the Brooklyn yes. Academy of Music. And, right. he, and he was 71 or 72. Yes. yes. So there is, there is a precedent for-, for I uh, like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I did an edition of, uh, well, they, as it turned out, the almost complete works of Shakespeare. Uh, and, uh, and it turned out that uh, what was missing from that edition was pointed out to me by an actor who was using it to play the title role in that play. He asked me to turn to that line and see if I noticed anything peculiar in my edition. And I did, and I didn't see anything at all unusual about it. And finally, he pointed out to me that it was missing one word, the word not. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it wasn't very long after that before Susan Stamberg of uh, All Things Considered on National Public Radio insisted that I come and explain to her how this had happened. And, um, and I pointed out, you know, Susan, we, we all think of Hamlet as the thinking man's hero. Yes. In the Guild Shakespeare edition, he's the positive thinking man's hero. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's, been, it's been fun preparing uh, our, our text for the, did I say we were going to film the Hamlet? I didn't say I, that. I did, yes, right. We're, we're going to do it in the theatre, Theatre Royal Windsor, once the theatres are open again. But in the meantime, we're we're going we're going to film it there. And uh, so I, I I've been having the fun of comparing the folio version, the the version of the play that appears in the first collected works of Shakespeare after his death, and the quarto version published presumably when he was alive, based very much on 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 what the actors performed, perhaps on tour, a cut-down version of Hamlet. Mm -hmm. uh, and rather than saying in his first soliloquy, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I, or the second soliloquy, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I, do you know what the quarto version is? No, I don't think oh, I do. Oh, oh, what a dunghill idiot slave am I. Wow. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, what a dunghill idiot slave am I. And that means... We know what a dunghill yeah. is. We know what an idiot yeah. is, what a slave is. But when you say, oh, what a rogue and peasant slave, what is a peasant slave? 
I, so there we are. I, I, the, the quarto for students of Hamlet, the quarto is very interesting because it's much clearer. And uh, I, I suspect when the actors were on tour and Shakespeare wasn't with them, then they took advantage of his absence to, to make his text a little bit more available. You know, that's, uh, I, I think I'm correct that uh, Shakespeare's father was fined by the village of Stratford for keeping a dunghill on his property. Am I correct about that? You're absolutely correct. Well, maybe he was thinking of that. So maybe, and, and, and who knows? I mean, we, we, it's clear that the plays evolved as they were being performed. There probably was never a definitive version of a script during Shakespeare's lifetime, was there? I think that's right, and particularly of Hamlet, which if you play it in its entirety, it has been done. Kenneth Branagh made a film in which right. every, every word of every printed version of Hamlet was in there. Uh, it took four hours. Well, that's a bit hard on a, a modern audience. I, I hope we might get us raced through in, in two hours uh, if we don't have an intermission, which is discouraged these days because of social distancing and so on. Yes. So, yes. Yes, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there were different playing versions and, and one has the license to, um, to pick about at the text. But of course, it's all wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. His advice, Hamlet's advice to the players, he goes on and on and on and, and, and does rather hold up the action of the play. Uh, but is one wrong to think in that way? Perhaps, perhaps the whole point of Hamlet the play is that there is so much in it that uh, the actual plot, the killing of the murderous King Claudius uh, is only part of what the play is about. It's, um, anyway. It's, and it seems to me that in some ways it's kind of the operator's manual to doing Shakespeare. The Hamlet's advice to the players, for example. But yeah. then you also have, I think, I think one of the most brilliant uh, devices in the play is to put so many things in the mouth of Polonius. Yes. Um, by indirection, find directions out. Wonderful. I think, I think if you use that, that will, that will give you a key to just about any play by Shakespeare, but particularly that one. When, when, when I was playing Hamlet, um, the Polonius was James Cancross, an actor, a Scottish actor, now dead, who was a good friend. Uh, and uh, he and I had both been in the production uh, of Coriolanus, directed by Tyrone Guthrie. Have, have I mentioned this uh, just now or not? No, no. No, uh, someone else I was talking to about. Uh, Guthrie was the great uh, theatre designer, uh, a director of Shakespeare. And uh, uh, Jimmy said to Tyrone Guthrie, had he got any advice on playing Polonius? And Guthrie said, Yes, he did. He said, uh, Polonius is not his name. It is his title. Coriolanus, his real name is Gaius Martius, but he's named, Coriol named Coriolanus because he's the victor of Coriolanus. Mm -hmm. Polonius, he thought, could be the victor over the Poles. And that yes. Polonius had been in his time a great general and, and like many soldiers in Shakespeare, Richard III and Macbeth included, Coriolanus, uh, he gets involved in uh, domestic politics and becomes a sort of prime ministerial figure. Uh, and he's not as good as that, at that job as he was in the other job, and he became a national hero, which explains why everyone defers to him with the exception of Hamlet. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's a great, you know, he's an Eisenhower, uh, who lands in the top, uh, one of the top jobs in, in uh, civilian life and isn't really very, well, not fitted to it. I, I think that'd be a, a nice way into playing uh, Polonius. But I think you'd need, a pro, you'd need a program note, wouldn't you, to explain it? Mm -hmm. Well, not if, not if you do it. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. I'm far too young to play Polonius. <laughs> now, you, I can't recall, do you include Polonius in, in your uh, acting Shakespeare program, or is it in, in your more recent program? No, uh, the, the, the one you're referring to was all Shakespeare, and I think Polonius got a look in just, uh, but no, uh, not, not, not of late, no. Is that a role you've ever wanted to play? Well, it's a role that actors, I think, quite like to play because you're, you're usually dead by the interval and... Uh, <laughs> so you get a short home. night. You go home, <laughs> and, uh, uh, except they've probably got you playing the ghost or the gravedigger. That, that's a familiar double, isn't it? Uh, yes. No. Uh, of course, the, the, all these parts are wonderful and, and wonderful for older actors to play, actors who may not have the stamina to, 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 to play King Lear uh, would have enough energy to play uh, Polonius, particularly if he had a stick and could sit down every so often, you know. Yes. So, uh, men, I suppose the women, are very lucky with Shakespeare. There are lots of wonderful, smaller supporting parts are just as shallow as another in Henry IV part two. You can run away with the whole play. Uh, yeah. Because the scenes are so wonderful. Uh, so yes, uh, when, 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 because one's not playing the leading part, there's, there's, there's plenty of good stuff in Shakespeare. Now, if I recall, I think you are the, the only living Shakespearean actor to have created a role, to have been the first to play a role. Am I correct about that? Well, it, it, it's what I claim. I don't know. That. Okay. <laughs> when when on, on the quite a centenary of his birth and up there in Nottingham, where I'd done um, a production with uh, Tyrone Guthrie, we, we ended the season with a play by Shakespeare, which it was claimed had never had its, a professional production. It was about mm -hmm. Thomas More, who right. was a, a Catholic martyr. Uh, and, and this was a sympathetic uh, portrayal by, by Shakespeare of him uh, and perhaps didn't quite suit the authorities at the time who discouraged its performance. But anyway, somehow it, there's no recorded professional production. I think it may have got found its way onto the radio, BBC radio, uh, and amateurs had certainly done it, but the first professional full-scale production was uh, in Nottingham, and I, by fluke, was cast as, as Thomas More and, and got to do uh, the great speech about immigrants, or strangers, as he calls them, right. uh, when, when he's putting down a riot in the streets of London. Uh, I, I, I do commend people, look it up. The first line is, um, uh, grant them removed. If you just type that in Google, grant them removed, uh, it'll come up. And uh, it's a startlingly uh, relevant piece about loving your neighbor as yourself, basically. Yes. Well, I recall that you, uh, you quoted that in uh, uh, at the time when we presented the the Gilgit Award to you in uh, 1996, and you related it to gay rights among other things, and yeah. uh, and uh, and it turned out that at that on that same day, and I don't think we knew it at the time, Justice Kennedy. Um, was the was the deciding judge in a case before the United States Supreme Court that established um, basically that uh, that overthrew a Colorado constitutional amendment that would have infringed on the rights of strangers, as you call them. Yes. Yeah. Well, 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 well. There you are. I mean. Um... It, 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 it's a mark, of course, isn't it, of, of Shakespeare's particular genius that uh, the politics of the plays, the way people conduct themselves under the law, 
uh, as, as well as people's individuality as, as perfectly ordinary human beings with loves and hates and passions and jealousies, uh, he was writing about things that were eternal. Yes, or at least, exactly. or at least are still with us today. And, and so yeah. Yeah, the, the politicians in Shakespeare behave like politicians today. The people yes. in power behave like people do when they've got power. And, and mothers behave like mothers, fathers like fathers, children like lovers. We're, all, we're, we're still here. Uh, yes. And Shakespeare helped to define us by, by, by uh, uh, putting us within uh, his stories. Uh, and although people think, if they don't know Shakespeare well, it, well, it's too difficult for me. I don't understand the words. You might not get all the words, but my goodness, you'll get the characters. Yes. Uh, and they'll remind you, uh, not just of people you know or are related to, but they'll remind you of yourself, for goodness sake. Yes. Hmm. Well, in a few minutes, I want to uh, ask Nadine to come up with questions from viewers. But first, I want to ask a question that my daughter thought you might have some thoughts about. That is, what kind of man was Shakespeare? What is your image of him? Uh, a colleague, uh, a writer, and an actor, a man of the theater. Mm -hmm. Now, what his name was or who he was uh, shouldn't really matter, should it? Uh, and and there, there, there are other recipients of the Golden Quill that you were referring to earlier, like Derek Jacobi. Of course, and, yes. Another one, Mark Rylance, who who both doubt that that uh, it was the man from Stratford, as they called. Yes, him, right. Uh, who wrote the plays? Because they don't, they can't find enough evidence. Well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but I would prefer it if if, if it was the man from Stratford, uh, the man who, when he was a little boy, because of his father's position in town, he was the mayor at one point would have access to official visitors, which would include, during the plague years like now, touring companies of actors who played their plays in Stratford. In other words, there he was stuck in the middle of the countryside and seeing some of the best actors in the country on tour, uh, and his father was their host. And isn't it likely that young William uh, would have met them? And, and as I did as a kid, got backstage uh, and 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 got excited by the whole business of putting on plays. That seems to me a, a very feasible assumption. Uh, uh, and that it was that lad who, like me, left the provinces to go to London and and uh, mm. not seek fame and fortune, but just to meet the actors and be with the actors uh, uh, and love being with the actors in the way that Hamlet does. Uh, so that's the sort of man. Uh, I imagine. Probably he was as dull as ditch water. He, the real records that we have, apart from the plays, are all the bills he didn't pay, aren't they? And, <laughs> yes. and, and lawsuits that he took out. He seems to have been right. a, a, had a very middle class sort of attitude. Uh, it's difficult to know quite what his relationship was with his family. But, uh, and none of that matters because uh, the, the plays are what matter. And, um, but I, 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 I've often thought and said in, in rehearsal, we should think of Shakespeare as, as still alive, as, as someone who's just left the rehearsal room, but will be back. Uh, and we don't want him when he comes back to say, what the hell are you doing with my play? I mean, we are doing his play. Uh, yes. uh, and uh, his memory uh, is um, is crucial. I, I, I've never thought of these plays as just material you could use to express your own views. I, th I think the real trick of it for, for this, those who do a lot of Shakespeare is to start by trying to work out what he intended, uh, uh, even if it's to what his intention is in regard to the stress in a line, and that can be de devised by uh, understanding how the line was written and how 
whether it was in blank verse and whether it rhymed and so on, whether there was alliteration and, and where the stress should come in the de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum line. And, and that brings you back to the idea that it was a real person uh, who wrote, yes. wrote the plays. They didn't come out of a machine. They didn't drop from there. They're, they're, they're not like uh, Sophocles plays from someone about whom we know nothing at all. Uh, uh, he's one of us. Yes. Or rather, uh, we are lucky to be allowed in, into his company. And how do you read the sonnets? What do the sonnets? What do the sonnets tell you about Shakespeare, if anything? Well, I know people have written books, haven't they, including Oscar Wilde, on on what the sonnets are all about and whether they are not, in fact, one long poem, uh, and and are they directed to a particular reader? Uh, all I would say with certainty is that it's possible once you read them out loud, either to yourself or to somebody else, uh, they, they become little speeches. There is a tone of voice there. Yes. Only revealed when they're spoken out loud. Very dramatic. Very dramatic. There's an attitude. They're, they're tiny one-act plays, sketches. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's great fun for, for, for actors and others to, to, to work out who is it who's speaking? Yes. Uh, oh, he's in love. Are we sure it's a he who's in love? Yes, all right. Yeah. Well, who's he in who is he in love with? Is his love younger than him or more beautiful than him or more distant than him? Uh, and uh, is he speaking ironically? Does he not really mean what he's saying? Uh, is he crying? Is he laughing? Uh, is he pleading? All these very ordinary uh, human uh, emotions and, and actions are revealed uh, within each of the sonnets. Whether they all add up to something larger than themselves, uh, I don't know. I'm not qualified to say, but uh, they seem to me to run alongside the plays because, as you said, they, they, they are they are theatrical and and uh, merit and only makes sense, frankly, if they're spoken out loud. Yes, I agree. Let me call on Nadine now to see if there are questions from members of our viewing audience. Nadine. Yes, um, thank you so much. There are, of course, hundreds of questions, <laughs> and we will unfortunately not be able to answer all of them, but I've noted a few. Um, here's a question from Heather from Toronto. Uh, you've played so many roles over the years. Are there any roles that you haven't had the opportunity to play yet that you hope to do so in the future? Uh, no. Basically, uh, I, I, I've never had a wish list, but if, if you have the sort of career that I have and Derek Jacobi have and, and Mike Gambon have and Anthony Hopkins and, and Judy Dench, you know, British actors with lots of opportunities, we assume that one day we'll be playing Hamlet. We assume one day uh, that will develop into playing Richard III and we assume, I suppose, it'll end inevitably with false stuff. Oh, pray God not. Uh, uh, or King Lear or, or, and, and Prosper. Uh, so may, maybe I, there were parts that I was looking forward to playing, but looking back, I'm sorry I didn't play uh, Benedict. I think it's a, it, it's a wonderful uh, comedy role. Uh, I would have enjoyed Derek was wonderful in that. Yes, Derek, very good. Another part he's played of late is um, uh, Mercutio, which I, I, I think would suit a, an older actor knocking around with the boys. Yes, uh, but he's rather done it, so I don't think I've been doing that. So, no, uh, and beyond that, you can't say, oh, I've always wanted to play Napoleon, because what's the point of playing Napoleon unless there's a wonderful play called Napoleon? Uh, well, there is a quite a good one, uh, Man of Destiny by Bernard Shaw, and I actually have played that. So, <laughs> no, I, the, uh, re regrets, I have a few, but they're not really connected with uh, parts I didn't play. Mm. Next, Nadine. Um, a question from Pippa, who's calling in from Belfast. Is there a book that you would like to adapt to a play or film? No. 
I'm not a writer. I've been trying to write a play, actually. Uh, I won't bore you with, with the subject matter, but it... <laughs> I, I'm enthralled to writers, uh, you know. Uh, we do plays because they're, they're, they're well written. Uh, but to say, oh, this book would make a wonderful play, I wouldn't have the ima imagination to see that. So the answer is no, I don't. Um, you, I think this, you alluded to this um, during your conversation, but Sammy would like to know, what Shakespeare character do you think is the most overlooked? Oh, hmm. I don't, I, well, well, no, I can't. John, come on, help me out. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but obviously you, you've got a soft spot for Polonius. Um, yeah. <laughs> when you're doing a production, of course, no part is overlooked. And, and particularly in Shakespeare. Uh, the the second servant, you know, can have the most wonderful speech, and I think is it Cymbeline where, where unnamed lords have, have the most glorious verse to speak, and when they're speaking, everything pretty well everything else stops while the audience listens, so they're not overlooked. Um, yes, I can think of one actually. It is a it is a part I want to play and have tried to play it on a number of occasions, on film and stage, uh, Antonio in um, The Merchant of Venice. He is yes. The Merchant of Venice. Yes. It's not Shylock, it's Antonio, The Merchant of Venice. So one, one could claim that uh, he is right at the center, what well, he obviously is. Uh, and, and the great scene, often called the trial scene, where um, Portia gets her fiance uh, out of trouble by, by landing Shylock in trouble uh, is, is as much about that, but more, I think, about her wanting to meet Antonio, who she's been told her beloved, her fiance, loves more than anyone else in the world. It's a love triangle going on there. Antonio, right. Antonio is gay, and his first line in the, in the uh, play is, in sooth, I know not why I'm so sad. Well, we very f soon find out he's sad because his boyfriend has just yes. announced that he's going to get married to a woman. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful part, uh, Antonio, and it's an absolute leading part. And uh, I, I'm, although I've seen it well played on the lines I've been talking about, uh, I think that there's more, there's more discoveries to be made there. I agree with you. Yeah. Oh, good. Mm. Thank you. Um, question from, we have time for two more questions. Uh, this is from Marco. Um, if you prefer to play good guys or bad guys? Bad. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, of course. Well, n name me a wonderful part where the character is good. Well, Forrest Gump, Gandalf. Yeah. Gandalf the good, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but on the whole, you know, Saruman's a better part. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, you want to play Iago, not, not, not Othello. Uh, yes. It's such fun delving into your own nastiness and bringing it out under controlled conditions. Uh, but particularly those villains in Shakespeare, anyway, like Richard III and, 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 and primarily uh, um, Iago, who are dreadful, dreadful people and do dreadful, dreadful things, but because they have access to the audience and to whom they explain what they're doing and why, Iago's particularly particularly clear as to his motives, uh, we begin to sympathize with them a little bit. And, and so that is a thrilling thing for an actor to, to play someone who in real life they would not approve of at all, but in impersonating their wickedness, uh, discover that the audience uh, rather like the thrill of being intimate with it. It's, uh, yeah. Wickedness is very charismatic. 
Mac, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Can you can you think of a wonderful part of someone who's absolutely good? It is hard. It, it is hard. Yeah. They, it's, it's not very the not very dramatic, is it? Yes. A saint. No. Um. I think that's actually the perfect way to to end uh, the questions from the audience. And um, so I'm going to close it out by saying thank you so much, Sir Ian McKellen, for joining us um, in conversation with John Andrews. I think we had a wonderful, the audience had a wonderful time. We had I tried to keep track of everything we had. Viewers from Russia, Canada, Scotland, Bangladesh, Indonesia, South Africa, and the United States, of course, and that's just the people I could keep track of. So thank can you. I, can I just say one more thing about course. John and, and, and me? Because uh, when I started out, which I suppose it must have been, John, roughly, when you were starting out professionally, there was a, a, an unhelpful division between um, people who wrote about Shakespeare and studied Shakespeare and taught Shakespeare right. uh, and those of us who were the other sort of practitioner who did the plays and I think That's we rather right. respected each other uh, oh you academics you don't understand how things work and oh you actors you don't understand the minutiae of what I've discovered well very happily over my lifetime and career the, the two of us have come together haven't we and there's a mutual I mutual respect now and the, I, uh, uh, the, the sort of a, a academic study of Shakespeare I like to uh, be in contact with is very much related to the plays as um, scripts to be performed. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and John I know holds that strongly and, and so we, we are representatives of, of some alliance which is... Could has, not agree more, could not agree more. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the fact that we've had uh, members of the audience from all over the world. All the world's your stage, Ian. And all the men and women merely players. Yes. Thank yes. You. Thank you so much for a delightful conversation. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Happy lockdown. <laughs>